So even though I was successful on paper, I was miserable inside. Then there's also something that happens to high achievers or anybody again, is that I had a great practice, great reputation, beautiful wife, beautiful kid. There's nothing I didn't have. And I was completely miserable. So now what do I do? So talk about it, so there's actually a lot of anxiety with success. And we're distracted by achieving, achieving, achieving. It somehow holds things off. But see, when I was 37 years old and had a panic attack, I had actually achieved everything I was supposed to achieve to have a good life. And I was miserable. So this is a, I remember I had one gentleman in Sun Valley when I was in private practice there who had just sold this company for $50 million. He was 45 years old and he was in tears. He didn't know what to do. There were six gentlemen in Sun Valley in an 18 month period of time, all of them incredibly successful, they committed suicide. All males, all between 45 to 60, all incredibly successful, all had families, all had done everything you could imagine. Is a beautiful place to live. Why? Together, we go out there. Together, we begin to share. Together, we find our way. Welcome back to Mentory TV to another episode here with me, Patricia Falco Beccali. Well, you know, I'm very eclectic when it comes to the subjects I cover, hugely egotistical because I'm very curious about everything and very much interested. And then when I came across this book, Do You Really Need Spine Surgery by Dr. David Hanscom, I thought, huh, spine surgery, never covered that, did blockchain did crypto, did angels, uh, everything spiritual as well, but I haven't come across that one yet. I thought that's an interesting one to drill into. And then all the revelation happened because, you know, there are about over three, 300 million spine surgeries done a year globally. This is the latest data, 300 million spine surgeries a year and about 500,000 in the U.S. alone per year, and about 80% of the patients that come out of a very delicate surgery um, actually still have post-surgery discomfort. About 20% have the same pain, if not a worse pain. So it's an interesting one. There must be more to it than just physiology. And this is why Dr. David Hanscom is with us on the show to give us a little bit of another dimension. David, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your books. It's book number two. Welcome to Mentory TV. Thank you. Well, let me quickly, first of all, ask you, you know, looking at your life, you've been a spine surgeon for over 30 years. You right. have huge knowledge, huge experience. But if I look at your actual journey and where you started and where you are right now, you know, how would you actually describe yourself right now and what you do? Well, I re represent sort of a classic journey of coming from a very chaotic, <clears throat> abusive childhood. And you've heard of the term ACE scores, <clears throat> adverse childhood experiences. And here in America, there's a study done in 1999 out of Kaiser on 17,000 patients looking at weight loss. And they had a group of people with massive weight loss over, over one year. And they found out when they came off the program that almost every one of them went back to their original weight. And what they found out that what happened is that the correlation was with clearly with their abusive childhood. So the people that did not have abusive childhood did not go back to their original weight. And what they found out is called an A score. We just give a point for different childhood events that are adverse just a score of zero to 10. And this is things like physical, sexual, emotional abuse and neglect, parent in prison, parent on drugs, et cetera. So it's just a point scale. So if your score was five or more, you had a high chance of early death, hypertension, cardiac disease, suicide, depression, all sorts of stuff. So I came from that childhood. My score was five. It was sort of bad. And I became quote successful because I was trying to outrun my past. So I think that happens to a lot of professionals is that you come from a chaotic background, you're trying to make sense out of it. And so I became an overachiever. So I went to medical school. I went to a very high level spine fellowship. I was quote successful. 
And I was doing major complex spine surgery in Seattle, Washington. Then in 1990, I was driving across the 520 bridge in Seattle and had a panic attack. So I went from being a fearless surgeon to crippling anxiety in five minutes. Once that happened, I could, I could not turn back. I could not. I had multiple panic attacks, developed extreme anxiety, went, went on to a full-blown, was called obsessive compulsive disorder. And that's manifested by extreme intrusive thoughts. And um, I was suicidal. So how did I go from a fearless, honestly, a fearless spine surgeon to crippling anxiety in five minutes? It turns out anxiety and anger are the same thing, but anger covers up anxiety. And they're not psychological, they're simply physiological states. And when I say physiological, it's how the body functions. Your heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature, et cetera, are all physiology. So I went to psychotherapy for 13 years to come back out of this hole. I was still practicing. And of course, I was desperate to keep my practice. So I did everything I could. I saw doctors, tried all sorts of stuff, and nothing worked. So by 2002, I was in this hole for at least... 13, 15 years, I developed 17 different physical and mental symptoms, 17. So I had migraine headaches, my ears were ringing, stomach issues, back pain, neck pain, my feet were burning, skin rashes were popping up all over my body. And of course, nobody could tell me what was going on. So I was in a very dark spot. And for people that are suffering from chronic, I'm going to use the word chronic disease instead of the word chronic pain, because what happens is that the essence of chronic disease, mental and physical, is sustained exposure to fight or flight physiology. Because we're in, we're in, I'm going to use the word threat physiology as opposed to safety physiology. Because when you're in fight or flight, your body's consuming resources to survive. And so your whole body's under attack. That's why there's so many different physical and mental symptoms. So then the essence of so the essence of disease is sustained exposure to threat physiology. The essence of healing is more exposure to safety than threat. You can't get rid of threat physiology, but you can minimize your time there. What I would like, there's already so much in there. We have to unpack, David. And I love it because, uh, first of all, super appreciated that you're very open about your childhood. And I think childhood trauma um, is something that every one of us has. Some just put it away, that inner child, into their subconscious uh, and stumble over the same issues all through their life and never discover the real why. Uh, And to look and say, I had an abusive childhood, a difficult relationship perhaps with your mother is a very strong thing to say, to admit. And then also to say, hey, but that was the fuel for becoming an overachiever because I didn't feel enough. I was abused. I, I felt unloved and I needed to do something to raise the flag and show that I'm actually worth it. What I'm interested in is, you know, from this overachiever, all of a sudden, on that bridge, 37 years old, it's not really the kind of age of man is at higher risk of a of a heart attack. It's around 50 going, you know, going a little bit above 50. What was the actual trigger? Why all of a sudden that panic attack? Why all of a sudden that loss of control of continues, uh, continual panic attacks, considering that for the previous years, for the overachieving years, control must have been 100%, if not above. Well, that's the problem. That's the that's what got me sick. I was a master at suppressing emotions and feelings. And so when you go into spine surgery, it's extremely stressful. And then you have politics, you have patients, you have overhead, all sorts of things are happening. So I know I'm gonna use physicians just as a placeholder. I think every high level professional in every field, not just professionals, we all have stress. And it doesn't matter how much stress you have. When your body goes into fight or flight, it goes into fight or flight. So for me, what we have found out, I've known this since medical school, that the biggest factor creating chronic disease is chronic stress. Now, I heard that years ago and I go, well, huh, that's interesting because the body deals with acute stress pretty well. Something stresses you out, you solve the problem and move on. But see, with chronic stress, you're just, it's like dripping rain, dripping water on a rock. It just keeps eroding, eroding, eroding. So it's been shown for decades in multiple research papers that chronic stress is what causes illness and disease. Because 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 something special happens in the body, the fight or flight or the rest and digest modus, you know, between threat and actually feeling safe, triggers different things with us internally. Do you want to take us through that? 
Well, the problem is that in fight or flight, <clears throat> so you're in fight or flight, so it's adrenaline, which is increasing your heart rate. You've got cortisol, which is increasing your metabolism or fuel consumption. Then you have histamines, you're, and then you have what's called cytokines, inflammatory cytokines. So part of the fight or flight is the immune system. And that's actually the biggest problem because half your brain is the immune system. So your brain itself becomes inflamed. The speed of nerve conduction doubles when you're inflamed. So you're hypersensitive to everything. And so you're processing things at a very fast rate. But see, the problem is with chronic stress, you're in sustained fight or flight. And like every living creature, you have to rest in order to regenerate to go to fight or flight again. You cannot get rid of fight or flight because you wouldn't survive. But you have to be able to replenish the fuel. It's like a race car. If you don't stop at a pit stop, the car is going to run out of fuel. So that's what happens with the human body under chronic stress. People keep thinking that stress is psychological. It is not. It's a physiological response to a threat. So I have a model called dynamic healing, where you have your threats, the nervous system, and your physiology. So I call it the input. So you have your calm circumstances, threats. The research term is allostatic load, stress, whatever it is out there that you have to process in order to stay alive. So those signals are brought in by your nervous system. And so this, in your nervous system is processing this, by the way, at 40 million bits of information per second. Every sense, every, every organ is putting in input into your brain. Your brain's processing it. This sends out a signal that you're either safe or you're in threat. So when you're in threat, your brain sends out the signals of adrenaline and cortisol and inflammation. And then when you're safe, your body has growth hormone, serotonin, dopamine, anti-inflammatory cytokines. Your brain actually empties waste products at night when you're sleeping. And so you regenerate in order to fight another day. The, the issue, the biggest issue for me is that I have a couple major visions. One of them being is that essentially every symptom, illness, and disease is a result of physiology. <clears throat> and what's happened in medicine, we've gone to structure, and there's a term called MUS, called medically unexplained symptoms. Have you heard this term by chance? No, I haven't. So it came out in the family practice literature around 2002, terms called medical unexplained symptoms. And so patients come with all these symptoms like myself, and you can't find a structural reason for those. So the doctor says, well, we know you're suffering. These are medically unexplained symptoms. Have a good life. Well, what it does, it takes away hope. So you're suffering badly. So again, stress translates into physiology, translates into symptoms. So the term should be MES, medically explained symptoms. Because when I was in this state of everything going wrong, your physiology is off, everything's wrong. Because when your body's chemistry is off, every cell in your body is surrounded by this chemical environment. So the symptoms are completely explained. Exactly. And so is your perception as well. And I wanted to pick up on something you said about pain, because um, it is a bit of a double-edged sword with pain, also with anxiety, also with threat. These are actually things we perceive um, that protect us. You know, if I feel pain because I've put my hand uh, into the fire, that's good because it makes me pull my hand away rather than it getting burned. But right. here, the critical thing I think people need to understand is the difference between acute and chronic, okay? And also, you, you are talking about stress, which I think is very interesting because I was asked once whether I ever get stress. And my response was, I don't do stress. I don't do stress. I have stressors, which I need to deal with, which right. is process. Okay. Right. And maybe you want to take us a little bit through what you were saying about the water dripping on the stone, continuing to carve it out, make it hollow and empty, how maybe a lot of people feel, um, plus the hopelessness that is even given by classical medicine, where they just look at the actual pain of a vertebra, let's say, but don't go beyond and say, hey, maybe this is a, a symptom of something that originated in childhood. And I know it sounds now like plugging all of these things out of the air and putting it in one hodgepodge, but we are a system and we are kind of a hodgepodge that everything affects everything almost at the same time, or at least in a fairly predictable sequence. 
So let me just change the terminology just a little bit. Mm -hmm. So the survival reaction processes 40 million bits of information per second. The conscious brain processes 40. It's a million times stronger than your conscious brain. So what happens is these survival reactions. They are gifts. You cannot control them. They're automatic and they're hardwired. So people keep the, So the terminology we have for threat physiology, a cat has the same reaction, but humans have a word called anxiety. Anxiety actually is the pain. It's the result of the stress. It's not the cause. So then you, if the situation causing anxiety isn't solved, your body kicks in more of a stress reaction and you become angry. So anxiety and anger are the same thing. We're trying to get rid of the word anxiety. Just use the word activated threat physiology. Anger is hyperactivated threat physiology. And they're not responsive to rational interventions. You can't control them. Just let me just um, ask you one thing. Anxiety and anger. Um, when you say it's the same thing, for me, if I look at a person and I think they're anxious, they look to me like a victim, like scuttled up, they're anxious, they don't know really what to make of it. An angry person is expansive, is loud, comes across powerful. Where is the one equals the other, if I look at it this way? We, you can't go by the external reactions because it's just, a, it's just a different levels of chemistry. So a lot of people get super angry and just lock down. And some people are anxious and just can't stop talking. So, you, so, so when I'm saying that they are the same thing, they are the same thing. There's just simply a different degree of chemical reaction. Now, here's the difference. So, in nature, what are the rewards for feeling vulnerable? None. What are the feelings for feeling vulnerable? In, 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 you're kicked in, out of in, you're, you're kicked in, out in of nature. nature. Yeah. In, in nature, not humans. But oh, in, in nature. nature. If, is, right. is, you know, if you are vulnerable, you die. If we'll stop, you right. dry out. If you're a yeah. plant, uh, you're not flourishing. If you are fruit, you just shrivel away. You're not being eaten and then dispersed by the birds. You're right. Still- so animals, mammals, including us, there's no rewards for being vulnerable for, for, for physical survival. Now, humans have a problem called language. So we have thoughts that create physiology also. So thoughts are input, your emotions are your physiology. So we don't like to, so the problem with humans is that emotional pain and physical pain are processed in similar circuits. So the essence of human relationships is being vulnerable. But since emotional pain also hurts, Mm -hmm. there's actually not a lot of rewards for being emotionally vulnerable. It's the same problem, except it's the essence of positive human relationships. So what happens with anger is that the research shows that people that are bullies, angry, powerful bullies, is that they have more control. And you actually, so it shows that bullies have lower inflammatory markers in the average population. But what's really unpleasant is that the people who are bullied have higher inflammatory markers. It also shows that if you're angry and you win, your inflammatory markers go down. If you're angry because you're trapped, your inflammatory markers go up. Are you telling me it's a good thing to be a bully and get your anger out there because it gives you some sort of release and potentially a win? No. So that's because the world is run by bullies. So it drives human behaviors just need for more power, more control, because we know more control is actually anti-inflammatory. So yes, there's a physiological reward for being angry and being a bully, but it doesn't make for good human relationships. So again, we don't like to feel vulnerable, and that's actually covered up by anger, which is a higher reaction. So it's the same chemistry, except now you have dopamine and other chemicals on board with the anger. Anger is powerful. It's addicting. Nobody will ever, ever want to give it up. However, it's also the key to healing. So I have hundreds of patients that have gone to pain-free. My 17 symptoms are gone. And you I don't have migraine, mm-hmm. my ears don't ring, my back doesn't hurt, my feet don't burn, I don't have skin rashes, I don't have obsessive thought patterns, I don't have anxiety or depression, it's gone. So what happens, let me just be, I'm going to segue here just for a second. Mm-hmm. So the research shows that every chronic disease, mental and physical, has the same source. So at the cellular level. And so it turned out that anxiety, depression, bipolar, OCD, and schizophrenia are all inflammatory disorders. 
turned out that Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, cardiac disease, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, cancer, osteoporosis, autoimmune disorders, and a bunch of other ones, all are inflammatory disorders, every one of them. So they all have the same problem. So hopefully I'm not going too detailed here, but in this- So go, each, go, go right into the cell, go right into the cell because- So be every cell in the body has a capacity to survive on its own by itself. That's what bacteria are. They're single cell organisms. Every body in your cell can survive on its own and they're in a Petri dish on its own. So then the cells communicate with each other through cytokines, little molecules that communicate with each other. So each cell has a little engine called a mitochondria, which just generates energy. So there's a reaction of ATP to ADP, and that little chemical reaction releases energy. So to tell you how complex these cells are, every cell, each cell, one cell, there's 30 trillion cells in the body. Every cell has between 100,000 to 600,000 mitochondria. That's a lot of mitochondria per cell. So what happens under chronic stress, go back to chronic stress again, is that it's called pathogenesis, where the cell breaks down, or the, I'm sorry, the mitochondria breaks down in three stages. Then salugenesis is where mitochondria heals in three stages. Under chronic threat, the mitochondria cannot complete the healing cycle. Well, it never heals properly, and this is why it right. erodes over time. Right. That's why chronic stress is such a huge problem. Mm -hmm. So again, going back to chronic disease, mental and physical, it's all the same thing. Because what happens is ATP goes outside the cell instead of being inside the cell. It's highly inflammatory. You cannot measure it on a blood test and it makes people sick. And just to translate it into layman terms, whether you're be being beaten up physically or whether you're being abused psychologically on a cellular level, the pain is the same, the effect Absolutely. is the same, and the long-term impact on the human being is the same absolutely but again i wanted to take this again just to clarify we keep thinking stress as being a psychological issue right well depends how threat. resilient you are <laughs> yeah well i mean here's the thing is we want to do we want to do this mind over matter remember it's a million to one ratio of the unconscious survival reaction to your mind you it's a mismatch number one saying well stress is just a threat and it's your body's total reaction to this threat that causes this stress physiology. It's the physiology that causes the symptoms. It's not psychological. So again, all these diseases, anxiety, depression, OCD, are, are all physiological states of an inflammatory response. And it's, it's more complicated than that. I mean, there's all types of hormones going on. Your fuel consumption is high. It's like driving your car down the freeway in second gear. It's going to break down. Mm -hmm. So again, that's why chronic stress is such an issue because your heart, because your body has to regenerate in order to fight another day. What I would like um, to get my mind around is this extra reception and interoception, because you were talking about input and something happens and then there is a reaction. Okay. Right. And this input, I think, is where it's very interesting to distinguish, because if you have really things happening around you and yeah? somebody slaps you says something really badly that is something you perceive objectively the other thing is and you mentioned it earlier on david is your thoughts your repetitive potentially negative thoughts about yourself or about how you behave or being potentially perceived by the world but self-generated due to the childhood trauma due to perhaps the the subconscious mind kind of being pushed away or pushing away whatever was there in pain. Can you tell us where we can really start to distinguish? And and you're also talking about your book, uh, in your book about becoming resilient, because um, the brain doesn't really know the difference between reality and fiction. Well, human consciousness really throws a curveball at us. I mean, my, if I yell at my cat and insult my cat, she doesn't care, <clears throat> right? So that's a cat. A dog might be a bit different. <laughs> yeah. So the, humans have a problem because, again, emotional pain hurts. The same as physical pain. It's a problem. You said it really nicely. So this is a big topic. <clears throat> we'll just dive right into it. Okay. So you have dynamic healing. You have the input, nervous system, and the output. And so it's the balance between the input and your nervous system that determines fight or flight physiology. The essence of disease is sustained fight or flight physiology. The essence of healing is minimizing that and maximizing safety. 
That's, that's the whole process. So what happens with thoughts? <clears throat> thoughts are sensory input. Remember we said emotions are your physiology. So unpleasant repetitive thoughts is a research term. We use the term URTs. <clears throat> unpleasant repetitive thoughts are sensory input. They create fight or flight physiology. So then we can't, so with physical pain, you have an automatic withdrawal response. It's called the nociceptive system. With your thoughts, what do you do? There's no automatic withdrawal response. So what we do is we suppress them, which actually shows to be, to be even worse. So that's what made me sick. I was really tough. My nickname in high school was The Brick. I used to think that was a compliment. It was not. It was actually a disaster. So being a brick doesn't really enhance human relationships. So what happened is that, okay, expressed thoughts are a problem. Suppressed thoughts are even more of a problem. So it's been shown that suppressed thoughts actually crank up the opioid addiction problem. They make the thoughts stronger. They're more inflammatory. They actually shrink the hippocampus of your brain, the memory center. So whether you express the thoughts or suppress them, either way, we're, we're toast. So this inability to escape our consciousness or our thoughts, I think is the essence of all chronic disease. And when I talk to people carefully, these obsessive thought patterns or disruptive thoughts, whatever you want to call them, torture people. Constantly. And Constantly and drive can't. also their decisions there. In the psychiatric world, the psychology world does not look, to, look at these as a solvable problem. Now, there's a basic reason why, because they are solvable. So I'm going to go back to my story a little bit. In around the mid-1990s, I slipped into a full-blown obsessive compulsive disorder. So that's manifested by very intrusive thoughts. They're bizarre. They're despicable. They're intense. And for true OCD, it's around religion, sex, violence, and dirt. But when I talk to people carefully, everybody has some level of intrusive thoughts. And so I went to the end of the... So it turned out that suppressed, just suppressing stress in general is what made me sick. So the thoughts are just one of the symptoms that fired up my whole body. So my skin rashes weren't imaginary. My migraines weren't imaginary. My ears were ringing. I had ringing in my ears for 25 years. It's, it's gone. I never, I never expected that. Never expected this at all. But this is what happens when people heal. So it happens these unpleasant, repetitive thoughts keep coming out, coming out of us. You can do all sorts of things in life to try to outrun these things, but you cannot outrun your mind. So there's, so it's a solvable problem. So not only do I not have OCD, which is considered untreatable, I don't even have the normal intrusive thoughts that I used to have before I got sick. So I talked to a woman this morning <clears throat> who's gone through the process that I went through. And same thing, her thoughts are minimal. She doesn't even have the usual thoughts she used to have either. So what happens is you calm down the nervous system, these, start, these thoughts start to calm down. So here's the formula for actually solving the thoughts. <clears throat> so first of all, we'll talk about this at the end of the show. So I did write the book about surgery to clarify the decisions about surgery. I also wrote a book called Back in Control, A Surgeon's Roadmap Out of Chronic Pain. I didn't realize that the mental pain is by far and away the bigger problem than the physical pain. You actually cannot solve physical pain without solving the mental pain because the mental pain drives the physiology. So there's four steps to actually solving OC. I'll just use the word intrusive thoughts. <clears throat> you know, I talked to teenagers and people in their 20s. Um, I was suicidal. And what drove me to that point was these thought patterns. But it, it just before you continue with your story, these thought patterns, what was the origin? I mean, of these negative intrusive thoughts, they must have come from somewhere. No, this, these are 100%. Everybody has them. Everybody has them. Everybody has to send them. Yeah, something. No, if you come, there are, well, if oh, you come from an abusive childhood, they're worse because your nervous system is more fired up. So if your nervous system is calm, they're not nearly as much of a problem. So people, I had maybe 3% of people have true OCD. I do not like psychological diagnosis. So at what point do these obsessive thought patterns become, quote, the diagnosis? Because nobody wants to talk about them. And so the essence of my problem was suppression. Mm -hmm. I, I was incredible. I didn't know what anxiety was until I was 37 years old. I went from no anxiety to a panic attack in one day. I had a patient admitted to my ward at 28 years old under the orthopedic service where she came in with back pain and an anxiety disorder. I go, well, what's an anxiety disorder? So I had to go to my medical textbook to look up the word anxiety. 
you haven't come across in your old studies and your career as a surgeon that terminology in medicine? In which terminology? Well, the anxiety disorder. That was something you had to look up when you were look when you were talking to one of your patients. Of course, I heard about it, but it really interesting. No, it's interesting because you think this is exactly why I think classical medicine, in <clears throat> so many ways, is lagging. I think functional medicine, right? Well, but that's just my that's my my you know, layman medicine opinion. Medicine has no data to support what it does at all right now. They, mm -hmm. they I quit my practice because of this. Because symptoms, illness, and disease are caused by physiology. Mm -hmm. We learned this in high school, college, definitely medical school, that when you're under fight or flight, your heart races, you breathe quickly, you sweat. Um, I had forgotten that the immune system was part of this response. So sustained stress, sustained fight or flight causes disease because mostly because of the immune system. You attack your own body. I mean, I've seen autoimmune disorders since I was in medical school, but nobody, nobody ever told me, why do these occur? I mean, joints are destroyed, spines are fused. Um, I mean, incredible things happen, like with lupus, every organ system is beat up, the kidneys, livers, everything's beat up. So nobody ever told me why. So though that is an autoimmune disorder is not so, but again, it's a sustained exposure to stress that causes this immune response. So well, there's the also people are, that is the missing link, right? The inflammation that is triggered there. A metab I mean, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but you have definitely inflammation and definitely the metabolism. You're consuming resources instead of storing fuel. And so you can either store fuel or break it down. Storing fuel is called anabolic state. Taking down fuel is called a catabolic yeah. state. <clears throat> so you have to store the fuel in order to consume it. So there's a paper out of UCLA clear at the genome, the DNA level. There's 30 genes that actually dictate the, the production was called um, monocytes. Mm -hmm. And these monocytes actually consume bacteria and viruses. They're part of your immune system. And so under certain circumstances, you develop what's called warrior monocytes, which also attack your own body. So the Two factors that dictate the production of these warrior monocytes is number one, chronic stress. Same thing. This is at the genome level, not the mitochondrial level. And the other thing is social isolation. So these social factors flat out change the production of these white blood cells. So again, you have direct consequences, direct physiology. So at the mitochondrial level, which are the smallest organelles in the cell, you have the production of these inflammatory markers called ATP. The genome's even more, even smaller. And right at the genome, the DNA level right in the cell, you have the dictation of warrior monocytes based on chronic stress. And this is where epigenetics may also come into. And I think, right. before, I mean, I would like, I would like, before we get into this one, which I think is uh, really the question of, you know, if you have repetitive negative thoughts, you have the same reaction physiologically, it becomes almost an addiction to feel bad. We will go down that route as well, because I think it's very interesting. But coming back to your story, uh, David, which I find uh, extremely grabbing is, so overachiever, all of a sudden you had your blow up, anxiety attacks, going into OCD with all the, you know, bells and whistles, as they say. And then you arrived even at a point where you felt suicidal. Now, that is a state of depression so deep that you go like, the only way I can mood shift is actually by being dead. Nothing else will help. Absolutely. Yep. But I didn't know it was all inflammatory. I thought it was psychological. I went into psychotherapy for 13 solid years. That's a lot of psychotherapy. And what I didn't realize, let's go to the solution for a second, is that if you're focused on the problem from a neuroplasticity standpoint, where is your brain going to develop? So we're, so we're so used to fixing, 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 we actually inadvertently reinforce the problem. So with the obsessive thought patterns, you can't escape your thoughts. You can't suppress them. So what do you do? How do you heal? Let's get to that then. So I found this out by 15 years of trial and error. I would say even the last six months, I've had some huge insights into this. Um, do you know Stephen Porges by chance, who wrote the polyvagal theory? No, not yet, but- uh, Well, he's really a huge thinker in this world. So 
Well, I met him about three years ago, and his wife, Sue Carter, is a brilliant researcher on oxytocin. So it turns out that social connection yields oxytocin, which is highly anti-inflammatory. Stephen Portis wrote a book called The Polyvagal Theory. He's been doing this for 40 years. So we have a work group. That Poly, polyvagal. Is that polyvagal. A couple, mm-hmm. how, how is it? Polyvagal. Yeah. V-A-G-A-L, the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve. I was just about to say the vagus nerve. Okay. Mm-hmm. Which is highly high. Is the inflammatory nerve in the entire body. It goes to every organ. So you have a parasympathetic nervous system, which is anti-inflammatory. You have a sympathetic nervous system, sympathetic nervous system, which is activated and inflammatory. So right this second, we have this back and forth all the time between parasympathetic and sympathetic. So it turns out that under fight or flight, the sympathetic nervous system is activated. You counteract that with the parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. So it turns out with thoughts, activate the sympathetic nervous system. So there's four steps to healing. And then we'll work backwards after I mention this. Mm -hmm. The first step is you have your thoughts, you have your nervous system, and you have the reaction. So what the psychology world has not acknowledged is the physiology. So you try talk therapy, try to rationalize your background, rationalize your past. You also have to trauma therapy. But remember, we're programmed by every second of our life up to this very second right now. And we're programmed by who everybody else thinks we should be. Who are we? So our parents, teachers, children, society, everybody's programming us every second about, about who we should be. So I wrote a website post a few weeks ago called Stop Looking for Your Authentic Self because it's right here. It's right in front of you. Because if, if you say something that, that I react to, is from something in the past. The problem with trauma therapy is you create a trauma story, and, it, and when you're triggered, you're, when you're triggered, you're triggered. And it doesn't it matter why you're just, triggered. You're it triggered. Just it could be one up. of mm-hmm. trillions and trillions of thoughts in your brain. Yep. I don't know how many seconds are in my life to this very second, but anything can trigger you. Anytime you're triggered, something in the present brought up something from the past. That's how we learn. We memorize these things. So the point being is that, yeah, some people have more traumatic backgrounds, which means there's more potential triggers, but to develop a trauma story actually anchors you to that story. So it doesn't matter. because you. So I did 13 years of psychotherapy. I was focused on the problem, focus, 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 and reinforcing those circuits. In, in so, your book, so, just to interject, in your book, you even said, never talk about your pain. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right, exactly. So, and I did this, I mean, most people that are in pain spend probably 60% of their conscious hours searching for a solution. And why wouldn't you? But it turns out the mental pain is a bigger problem by far because you cannot escape your thoughts. So the four parts of healing, number one is thought diversion. Number two, turning down the heat. Number three, moving into creativity and life that you want. And the fourth one is sort of an existential, you, you end up actually dissolving your ego. So sorting this out a little bit, the thought diversion occurs with three basic ways of doing it. There's other ways of doing it, but you have these thoughts coming into your brain. You can't control them. So the first step in the healing journey, absolutely mandatory, is, is called expressive writing. Expressive writing. Oh, you're, you're straight into the writing. I thought you might be going first into questioning your thought. Like no. Dana Eamon does, hey, mm-hmm. you have got these automatic ne- negative thoughts, he says, but are they true? And just by questioning them, you kind of distance yourself from that. And that is the first action. But you say you have thoughts, write them down, creative writing? Uh-huh. Yep. It, it's, not, not, it's called expressive writing. So this is there's 2000 papers now that document the effect of this it was the first papers published in 1986 by dr james pennybaker and he wrote this book dr pennybaker dr smythe um talked about the benefits of expressive writing so it's lower viral load in hiv it's better student performance better mood better actually better wound healing it's unbelievable what it does so something so we asked dr pennybaker well why does this work he goes i don't know but you can't control your thoughts, but you can separate from them. So the thoughts are on the desk. You're here. You're now separated by vision and feel, which are part of the unconscious brain. And then you tear them up instantly. And you tear them up for two reasons. One of them is to write with absolute freedom. The more intense thoughts you can get on paper, the better. Second of all, they're just thought. 
So you don't want to analyze them. Oh, that's an interesting one. Because, because the you're, an you're, analysis will maybe take you into the same kind of negative vortex uh, trajectory. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, just just, a, just, a, just one on, on the expressive writing. I am on my own writing journey. And actually, I got stimulated by my by my daughter. And I, I said, hey, what are you doing every night? And she said, mommy, um, I saw it on TikTok. And there was this girl. And she, she said, 365 days of what was the most beautiful moment of my day. So I started doing this as she's doing it. And it's really fun. And she said, huh, how clever. Let me try that too. And that is where uh, my journey started, where every day, I sit down and I write down maybe the thoughts I had, a little bit of a diary thing, but certain things come out that I didn't expect to come out. Do I look back? No, I don't reread. But what I notice in my own feeling of day one of my days of writing my day down to, let's say, yesterday, that it becomes always more positive, more appreciative, more of a good story and feel good impact. So let's unpack this a little bit. So this is a different part of the journey. So the expressive writing is just an exercise. The more negative and dark thoughts you can get on paper, the better. Because that's what we're suppressing. Remember, the suppressed thoughts are the problem. Get rid of the garbage. So detox, basically. You not get rid of them because there's trillions of thoughts. It's just a separation metaphor. So thoughts are here. I'm here. You get the darkest thoughts you can get on paper. That's why you write. That's why you tear them up. So you definitely have to tear them up. You can shred them, burn them, tear them up. Whatever you need to do, you have to destroy them. So it's, it could be five minutes, 10 minutes. It's just an exercise. Okay. So we're looking at the first part of this thing is you're diverting the thoughts. So expressive writing is number one. And again, that's a whole really detailed discussion, which we can have another day. But the expressive writing is the only mandatory step of this whole healing journey. Nobody heals without it. You just can't do it. It's a must. Okay, let's write it out. Okay. It's, just, it's the way consciousness works. And again, we talk about those details later if you like. Um, second thing is mindfulness, like at, we'll call it active meditation, where you go from racing thoughts to different sensation. So just you know, sit back in your chair for a second. Take a deep breath. Let it out. Done. That's it. So you've gone from racing thoughts to a different sensory input. And it's a little different than mindfulness. I call it active meditation because it's three to five seconds, multiple times a day. You're a little bit wired. You just drop it down. We, used to, we actually taught our surgical fellows this technique in surgery. So your mind starts racing. You just go to touch. And our complication rate dropped through the floor because you're connected to the moment. So your brain and think, your thoughts take you different places. But with active meditation, <clears throat> it's real time, multiple right. times a day. Pretty soon comes automatic. Just drop it down again. Drop your shoulders. That's it. I'm good. So that's a thought diversion maneuver. The third thing is, you already mentioned this, cognitive behavioral therapy. <clears throat> you actually start writing down these crazy thoughts. Dr. Burns has a book called Feeling Good, which actually started my journey. And there's 10 cognitive distortions of labeling, catastrophizing, should thinking, perfectionism. Mm -hmm. All these things are uh, cognitive distortions. That means like how you perceive things. Cognitive distortion right. means that you have some sort of perception, which is actually not reality. It's Correct. objective reality. Right. So it turns out that self-esteem in and of itself is a massive cognitive distortion because it's labeling. And again, self-esteem to me is the driving force behind all of this because you're using conscious means to deal with these massive survival circuits so healing occurs by learning how to process anxiety and anger, which means you use lower physiology. And then the real healing occurs about moving into what you talked about, play, creativity, good food, good wine, good friends, spiritual journey. That's where the healing occurs, but you can't do that to bypass the circuits. So they're linked skills, but they're separate. So you learn how to process anxiety and adversity. You learn how to look at that as a gift, by the way, so it keeps us alive. And then your conscious brain is free to move forward in the direction that you want. But you can't use that activity to counteract these massive survival forces. That's how you heal OCD. Because if you're trying to fight these massive forces with rational means, it just fires things up. So the first step is thought diversion, either with expressive writing or actually all three. Expressive writing, again, David, you can do it through his book. 
about writing in a three column technique and recognize the distortion. And you just said something really key is that once you recognize a cognitive distortion, there's actually nothing to do because it wasn't real in the first place. So the second thing is you got to turn down the heat. So the thoughts hit your brain that's on fire. And so it's about, I call it anger processing. Forgiveness is too big of a word. So there's a bunch of ways of remember anxiety is an activated threat physiology. Anger is hyperactivated. So as you learn how to turn down the heat and process anger, as the heat drops down, that's what's missing in the psychology world is that they're not teaching people to drop down the physiology. So there's thought diversion, there's turning down the heat. The third step is actually moving into the circuits that are enjoyable. So to have a good life, you have to live a good life. It takes practice and repetition, right? So, an op- so, a positive, so positive thinking is a disaster because it suppresses negative thinking, but a positive outlook and vision is absolutely critical. So then as your brain moves into these circuits, that's where the healing actually occurs. And remember, this happens every day, multiple times a day. There's no one and done. There's no point where all of a sudden you're just in nirvana. So some days your stresses are high. So again, the dynamic healing model, you have the input nervous system and the output. So if the input is just too intense, you're going to go into fight or flight, right? If you resist that, you're in trouble. You have to feel to heal. Okay, so your stresses are high or you have it with the nervous system is diet, exercise, and sleep. If you haven't slept, diet's bad, whatever it is, whatever reasons you're under-resourced, again, you're, you're going to go into fight or flight. So in medicine now, you're treating just the symptoms. And you're right, with functional medicine or integrated medicine, they acknowledge this relationship between your stresses and who you are. So that's where medicine is badly missing because we're all different. It's one of the key factors of actually healing is taking control of your own life because you look at things differently. So you learn how to process stress in a way that has less impact on your nervous system. You learn ways to increase the resilience of your nervous system. You can directly lower the threat physiology by, again, drop it down for a second, take a deep breath. So, for instance, you know, rubbing your forehead stimulates the fifth cranial nerve that stimulates the vagus nerve. Humming actually stimulates the seventh cranial nerve which stimulates the vagus nerve. Breath work stimulates the vagus nerve. Um, so there's a bunch of ways of actually lowering your inflammatory markers directly. I had one friend of mine who had these crawling sensations over his entire body for almost six months just miserable with it. And we talked about the process we're going through and he chose a route that was a little, a little different. He became obsessed with breath work, humming. There's certain pictures of music and in three days, the symptoms disappear. But this is, let me just pick up on this one because I have my morning routine and everybody looking at me from the outside, not knowing maybe or yeah not knowing having investigated not investigated into the toolbox that there actually is we can do to deal with our negative thoughts because they're there as you were saying they come they come out of nowhere and everybody has them maybe they are there to protect us just you know because we are still like the neanderthals thinking there's going to be a you know a a tiger attacking us so they just try to keep us on toes but in our today's world it just hurts so when i when i wake up and i take you through it a little bit because you're the expert you tell me if you think also i'm mad everybody from the outside would just say i start with already whilst i'm kind of half waking up i'm starting to breathe differently so i breathe in long plus a little bit on the top and then i have my thoughts where which are very reinforcing thoughts i have a certain visualization and then i start breathing out long 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 whilst i'm doing this i'm actually touching my vagus nerve here breathing mm-hmm. out breathing out and this physiological involvement plus the thoughts plus the guided thoughts plus right. the visualization puts me straight away in a very different i don't know i, I want to say frequency okay right and and you were mentioning humming, so I also tap. Yeah, so that's yep. part of my morning routine that I tap. I have certain things I want to just become better at or overcome right. from my own childhood traumas, and I tap. And at the end of my tapping session, I have to hum. I have to. Hum. <laughs> it sounds like really awful. Right. And then I have to count down. And it is so funny that at the end of three times of this circuit, 
my whole body is like over i don't know i don't want to say it's like uh it's almost free it's unleashed from it should be unleashed from a good night's sleep but there's heaviness and that rest of the heaviness gets into lightness and then i turn around and then i look after what i have to look after as, as a, you know a mom and a wife and, and a family member and, and a pro professional but without this morning routine if i miss it by any chance I miss it. I, I do cold showers. I do, you know, I do all of this as well, simply because I know I always have to manage whatever emotion may come that I don't want to have. But physiologically, as you were saying, if you want a good life, you have to make it a good life. You cannot just say, okay, I want to attract a good life and just stay inactive. Well, I mean, what you, okay. So let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. So I'm a surgeon. Mm -hmm. And medicine looks at this stuff is like, well, this is this is crazy. This is psychological. It's not real. Well, that's not true. So what you've done, everything you've done stimulates the vagus nerve. You changed your physiological state. So that's not psychological. You, I mean, humming is not psychological. So why do you feel better? So it's not magic here. It's when let me take it take the back. Life itself is a miracle. And everything we do to our body has an effect. And so what you've done, you change your physiology from fight or flight to more of safety. And so rubbing the forehead, humming, breath work, all these things do exactly that. And that's with active meditation throughout the day. You just bring it down, bring it down, bring it down. It's not the final solution. So the final solution for chronic pain, by the way, is that there is no final solution, number one. Second of all, you become very skilled, again, processing adversity and nurturing joy. happens every day, multiple times a day. There's no beginning or end point to it. So I call it becoming a professional and living your life. It should be, it you should have to be a pro. I love that. You have to become a professional of living your life. And that is so true. Nobody gave us a manual on how to live a good life, right? Or how to use our brain or what to make of our emotions or how to raise children. Nobody. Well, but we see, <laughs> this is my delusional vision if we taught these skills right there in kindergarten and first grade it's a common touch point so right now if somebody okay when you're anxious or angry your brain goes offline so a kid gets frustrated what do we do with them we change your behavior you know we we've suppressed that reaction so we've actually fired up the nervous system in a big way so these are overwhelming survival feelings nobody tells us what to do so those are skills you can teach right there in first grade and kindergarten going forward. And then where did I learn to nurture joy? So I was so busy out running my past, I have a cover zone of being a workaholic, which is a way about running anxiety, but it's not nurturing joy. Yeah, the so oxytocin is never, I was never taught that. So even though I was successful on paper, I was miserable inside. Then there's also something that happens to high achievers or anybody again, is that I had a great practice, great reputation, beautiful wife, beautiful kid. There's nothing I didn't have. And I was completely miserable. So now what do I do? So talk about since it, so there's actually a lot of anxiety with success. And we're distracted by achieving, achieving, achieving. It somehow holds things off. But see, when I was 37 years old and had a panic attack, I had actually achieved everything I was supposed to achieve to have a good life. And I was miserable. So this is a, I remember I had one gentleman in Sun Valley when I was in private practice there, who had just sold his company for $50 million. He was 45 years old and he was in tears. He didn't know what to do. There were six gentlemen in Sun Valley in an 18 month period of time, all of them incredibly successful. They committed suicide. All males, all between 45 to 60, all incredibly successful, all had families, all had done everything you could imagine. It was a beautiful place to live. Why? Because it, you cannot outrun your mind. You just can't do it. You cannot outrun your mind. And I remember reading in your book, you can actually not fix your brain. You cannot change your brain. Right. right. You, can you have to you rewire brain. it. Right. Tell us more about this, because I think that might feed into what you were just saying. So I'm going to, um, my wife gives me a hard time with these metaphors, but let me, let me try two metaphors. Maybe you'll like them, maybe you won't. So just the last six weeks, there's been a huge insight into these obsessive thought patterns. I think they are the driving force behind bad human behavior. They're also the driving force behind 
behind mental and physical disease begin again because you can't escape these things they drive your physiology into disease and when i talk to people in their teens and their 20s with eating disorders and hair pulling and all sorts of things they can't escape these thoughts and so again the so i'm going to present the healing journey in a different concept i call it a sequence the letter c my wife came up with, with the letter c there's three c's of healing there's connection confidence and creativity so just use a metaphor of a tree where the soil represents your entire past up to this very second. So the first step is allowing the root system to develop into your past and being with it. So try to fix and solve it, analyze it, or whitewash it with self-esteem, learning to be with your past. What can I learn from the past is a key. Learning to be embrace with it. Your That's the first past. step. Embrace it. That's what you have. So I call it connection. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying necessarily embrace it because a lot of it's pretty unpleasant. So you don't have to you don't have to feel good about things that are bad, but it takes a certain skill set to actually allow yourself to be with unpleasant feelings. And Freud said this 150 years ago that the essence of mental health is learning to be with unpleasant feelings, because if you fight them, you've actually reinforced them. So the trunk of the tree is confidence. There's a whole set of tools that allow you to be with your past, learn from it, develop strategies to move forward. So again, that's the process of adversity, which I'm going to call again activated threat physiology. Humans use the word anxiety and anger. Again, those are physiological states, not psychological. So it takes a set of tools to actually to be with your past, learn from it and move forward. Then the real healing occurs at the top of the creativity. So it's connection, confidence and creativity. So you can't be creative if you're fighting anxiety and anger, right? So if you're using... they are still in the past. So in creating usually is something of the future, starting from where you are going forward rather than right. where you are. Mm -hmm. And you said the words in your morning routine of curiosity, gratitude, giving back. Those are a lot of energies in fighting anxiety and anger. But the problem is when you're anxious and angry, physiologically, your thinking brain goes offline. You physiologically cannot think clearly. It's impossible. Your brain activity has gone to the survival centers or the limbic system. Of course, you are full of uh, norepinephrine and adrenaline, and you just want to, you know, kill right. or run. Right. But not think. So, so the brain changes. The brain changes activity dramatically. So again, we're so used to fixing. Fixing your life doesn't give you the life that you want, right? So the data also shows that if you live a hedonistic lifestyle, your inflammatory markers go straight up. Straight up. If you live life with a sense of connection, passion, and purpose, your inflammatory markers go straight down. It's the same lab that talked about this warrior monocytes. So the graph is unbelievable, straight up versus straight down. And again, going to the fact that you cannot outrun your mind, you're doing all these things like adventures and pleasures and acquisitions to distract yourself from the survival circuits. It doesn't work. It can't work. In fact, it's highly inflammatory. So it's a way of suppressing Remember, suppressed stress, suppressed thoughts are actually more damaging than expressed. So again, it's connection to allow yourself to be with these thoughts, to quit fighting them. What can I learn from them? I just have to show you this picture. So I'm an 85-year-old woman who was in chronic pain for 55 years. And she's now been out of pain for about seven years. And she is delightful. Her name is Rita. <clears throat> and so she came up with this word called Neuroschmidt. Okay. So nourishment, nourishment, in other words, you're, when you go into the creative mode, you're stimulating neuroplasticity. Your brain changes structure. So what happens, she used the word nourishment, but what, what can I learn from the past to provide nourishment for my brain going forward? I love that. So it doesn't matter how long you've been in pain. It doesn't matter how many symptoms you've had. You can reprogram your brain around anything. But even even phantom limb pain, which the limb is gone, for God's sake. Mm -hmm. There's no leg. You still feel the pain. You can even reprogram around that. And I think this neuroplasticity, a lot of people are actually not aware of. We are really the master of our mind because we are in a fixed, quickly society. Nobody really is used to or accustomed to putting in a long-term work repetition right. over and over because this is what it 
this your healing approach is all about and if we we talk about you know the physiological impact of a surgery there and then maybe taking two hours six hours or even longer that is one moment but the long-term healing also takes long term it takes repetition it takes the stumbling and saying okay i did stumble i'm still going to connect with whatever i feel i'm still going to be confident and then of course i can create but it's a long-term approach and in that sense quite lonely you know because you have to do the work uh, repetitive and sometimes you even feel silly go like oh my god when is this ever gonna stop maybe never <laughs> you know yeah can i can i rephrase what you just said yes please <laughs> please so <clears throat> the key word is persistence it's actually not work oh is that like reinforcing if remember if you, over and over again, Huh. Well, because the work part of it implies fixing, fixing, fixing. And creativity is not work. In other words, all you're doing is connecting to your body's capacity to heal, which is infinitely more powerful than us trying to fix ourselves. So what happens is interesting. The tipping point is always anger. Once you learn how to process it, it's, just, it's a lot easier doing this than it is staying in the hole. So what happens, the key word is persistence. I don't like the word acceptance. You don't have to accept the fact you're, that you're anxious and angry. You don't have to accept the fact that life is tough. Those are things that are, are not great. So all you're doing is allowing your body to heal. So the number one thing is actually being kind to yourself, no matter what. And I'll try to get rid of the word success versus failure. Some days you're in fight or flight, some days you're not. That's just life. And so there's many steps to it. So it's persistence, but it's not work. Because I worked at this for many, many years. And the harder I worked at it, the worse it got. So it's huh. like a Chinese finger trap is that you're trying to pull yourself out of the trap. It gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And we're used to, you know, again, <clears throat> um, so what happens is such a, is a paradoxical process. It's actually a matter of letting go. So I say, look, the starting point is actually embracing or acknowledging your skepticism and doubt. It's not about generating belief in David Hanscom at all. It's not about generating belief in my book. It's not about believing in the doc journey, whatever I'm doing, it doesn't matter. What, it, what you're allowing yourself to do is actually believe in your body can heal. That's it. So the first step is embracing your skepticism. Said, I don't want you to believe anything I said today. Nothing. Don't believe anything. You can listen to it, learn it. You know, well, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. So you mentioned the word curiosity. So I would hope today, I think you would wish the same thing. I'd like to be people, at least be curious and go, huh, there's something here that I don't know. And I didn't know. It's like being a fourth dimension. So starting with your skepticism, skepticism is actually a starting point because that's what's actually there. So again, the first C is connection. So if you think the skepticism isn't there, you're wrong. Second of all, I have a person right now who actually, did, I've had this happen multiple times over the years. People have been in chronic pain for 10, 15, 20 years. And they say, I don't, ha I don't have any anger. Those people never heal. Never. I can't break through. And well, I'll ask them a simple question. Well, what about being trapped by pain? And honestly, almost to the person, they just explode and start yelling at me, uh, going, I'm not angry, but they're yelling at me. So connecting to your anxiety and connecting to your anger is a pretty big deal. So again, the process starts with connecting with what is, whatever it is. And then hope starts to emerge as you start going through the steps. So you start going through the steps carefully. That's why I put together what's called the DLC journey, direct your own care journey. So we have an app and a course, and it's a stepwise process. The sequencing, the sequencing is really critical because you can't jump from anxiety and anger to joy <clears throat> without a sequence. That's positive thinking, which doesn't work. So <clears throat> there's a sequence that takes persistence 15 minutes a day is all I, all I suggest. <clears throat> and um, I just had a person in my group <clears throat> who I've been working with, working with for six months. She's in her mid-20s. And I had given up on her. I, I mean, there's family crises, there's relationship crises, all sorts of stuff. And all of a sudden, two weeks ago, she just exploded out of the hole. I can't even put it into words. I just talked to her this morning and going, was this for real? And she is so excited. But she had all the usual anxiety issues, chronic pain issues, all sorts of stuff. And all of a sudden, her, her tipping point, again, like everybody that does this, this is what happens, by the way. This is why I quit my practice. 
she decided, I'm not going to be a victim anymore. That's it. And all of a sudden, bam, you learn how to process adversity. And now she's moving into joy. It's a massive change in your body's chemistry. So for her, it was about six months. <clears throat> I have people within two weeks, all of a sudden blow out of the hole. Some people, it's two years. So the number one word is persistence, persistence, persistence. The number one factor that predicts healing is simply one is to engage. That's it. Absolutely. And then that is actually a very positive trigger because you feel empowered. You actually right. feel that you can control, which is positive in itself. And I think what you were saying there is so important because the moment you say letting go, which I think is one of the hardest tasks, you know, yeah. that we need to learn, the moment you actually manage to let go, you know, this kind of freedom and space, you really then right. feel is incredible. And that is already that space that you can then start filling up with positive creation, which I think is exactly it. And it is so, so key what you were saying that, you know, whatever happens on a physiological level, let's, you know, let's X out the accidents and everything, but like, inflammation caused chronic pain, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, actually often starts with something that is psychological anchored not only in your brain but in your childhood and that needs to be somehow at least written out <laughs> then thrown away and go through the process but again that is your journey that right. is what you need to do if you want to do it and i think this entire circle makes sense one has to kind of get a little bit clear distinguish distance and then put it back together and then see the impact as you were saying don't don't trust me don't don't believe in me just try it out if you're curious but that's already right. a first active step david we have to kind of find um you know a conclusion to our fantastic conversation i tell you i wanted to talk about food as well you know coming into the equation how food is also one of those right. input stressors or non-stressors that impact very much what is happening even on a neurological level maybe next time we speak but let me ask you a couple of questions that i tend to ask at, at the end of our conversations um a couple of questions one is if you look back at your child david what would you say was what you missed the most, which on the other hand created who you are today? Well, I mean, I never felt safe as a child. But the reality is the reason why I didn't know what the word anxiety was because that was my entire life. That was my baseline. So if your baseline is chaos, I don't ever remember being nurtured. So what happens with the healing process, you learn to help yourself feel safe. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's amazing. Yes. Um, and uh, it resonates very much with me um, as well. But we'll talk about this maybe off air. The second question, if you had to pick two songs, one from the David as the pre-37 year old overachiever, and you're still more than an overachiever because you actually make a huge difference, real difference to people. If you had to pick a song back then, which would express who you were, and a song that would express who you are today, which would be these two songs? Well, the one today would be just um, Let It Be. And the song back then, it's a song that resonates with me sort of in a tough way. It's, it's a song about the cats in the cradle, the silver spoon, it's about a father who never is home for his son. And so, yeah, that's the, I was the, well, both. I was both the son whose father's never home, and also now, as I raised my own son, I wasn't there a lot of the time and so yeah this busyness takes you out of life and yeah. so yeah actually um yeah so i was an idealistic i remember reading joseph campbell one day how saying idealism is dangerous my entire life was defined by ideals and they're gone fantastic and so, yeah, just being in a, being right here at this current moment is all there is. That's it. We know that intellectually, but it's actually a set of learned skills to actually get into the present moment. You can't just get here. Absolutely, absolutely. And what we think today, we are creating our tomorrow with. And I think this is something that is incredibly powerful. David, fabulous, fabulous book. You know, whoever picks this book up uh, doesn't really... Uh, you know, don't touch the book by its cover. I can only say to all of my community and followers because uh, 
it's not about spine surgery. Yes, there is a step, uh, step by step approach, whether you really need it or not, or whether you need a good conversation with Dr. David Hanscom in his today's position, um, purpose as a healer. David, thank you so much for being with us here on Ventures. Yeah. Thank you. Great conversation. Wonderful questions. So yeah, no, I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. And thank you, my dear Mentory TV community. More to come. Dr. David Hanscom, I think, is one of the most impactful, revolutionary, today you'd say disruptive uh, surgeon, doctors, healers that I've come across. And uh, pick up his books. One was published a few years ago in 2012, uh, Back in Control, and the one we just talked about, Do You Really Need Spine Surgery? But one thing for sure, we need to stay curious, look beyond what is here and now, and continue to create. You know, I also want to say that this process called the DLC journey, direct to care journey, is, is essentially the third edition of my book. It's essentially a stepwise process through the journey. And then again, the app, my wife's a tap dancer. So the app is extremely entertaining as well as educational. And so it's trying to bring about a sense of play, which of course is the antithesis of pain. So the app and the course have been really the latest, really reflects the modern neuroscience. Absolutely, absolutely. No, thank you very much for interjecting that. And of course, you can find David on the net. You find also the app. Please investigate, stay curious, and I see you next time here on Mentor TV. Bye. Together, we go out there. Together, we begin to share. Together, we find our way.